It is time to go deeper in God's Word. It's time to engage in truth. Here is Dr. Steve Ford and Pastor John Bornsheen. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Engage in Truth. This is John Bornsheen. I'm the senior pastor of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church right here in Colorado Springs. And I'm here in the studio with my good friend, Dr. Steve Ford. We are so excited to be with you here today because we are continuing in our study of resisting the devil. We have been going through these top 10 biblical warnings we need to stop ignoring. And last week, we just really started on the subject of resisting the devil. And so to continue in that vein of thought, because we've got a lot to cover in this subject, uh, Dr. Steve Ford, always good to have you, my friend. And I know you have really spent a lot of time on this subject in particular. So I want to thank you in advance for all that you're about to share with us. Always good to have you on the show, my friend. Thank you, John. Always great to be here. This is really a good topic. There's a lot to be said on this topic, you know, superficially that you may not think so, but as we dig a little bit deeper in what, into what scripture has to say. So I'd like to go back to James four, seven, where we really started resist the devil. Mm -hmm. And and, in, in that he says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. As we look at that further, you know, I've really been able to get a lot of benefit recently. I've, I've tried to be more diligent about memorizing scripture (laughs) <laughs> and one of the great things about memorizing scripture is you almost can't help but to meditate on it. Right. As you're memorizing, you really start thinking, wait, what does that mean as you're, as you're reading that scripture, as you're memorizing that scripture? And, and one of the things that really leaps out to me here is, well, what, what does it mean to resist the devil? Actually, what does that look like? If we dig a little bit deeper into that, we know that to resist the, the devil, one of the things that we most certainly need to do is to submit to God's lordship. You know, if we're being disobedient, then, you know, we don't really have that guarantee of victory like we do if we're walking in holiness and obedience before the Lord. And it, we, you know, we discussed, we, we've spent a lot of time on this show talking about Ephesians 6 and the full armor of God to resist right. the devil. And just like Jesus used Deuteronomy in the wilderness to refute Satan, you know, mm-hmm. in the same way, we're given that sword of the spirit to resist the devil through the power of scripture. That's right. Another interesting thing, sometimes you'll hear within church circles about I find it interesting. You'll hear people talk about rebuking Satan, (laughs) but you know, we see in Zechariah three, two and Jude one, nine, that the Lord rebukes Satan. I'm not sure that's really our role to go rebuking Satan so much as praying that the Lord would rebuke him. That's right. I think is a much more accurate interpretation of scripture. Yeah. And, and one thing we covered last week and just remind our listener today, sometimes a week goes by, we forget some of the points we covered. So just to recap on that, I, I think the, the text that is so fitting for this discussion, because there are a number, and you, you had picked up quite a few scriptures you want to share with us today, but specifically as we look at James chapter 4, verse 7, that word resist, antithstemi, it's to set oneself against or to oppose. And what we find here is that we are in opposition to the work of the enemy. And it's not just him, but all of his minions, right. all the fallen angels that are now we call demons that are doing his work and bidding across the face of the earth. And we dare not cower to them, but rather we understand that the Lord has given us victory because he has that victory. That's right. We are more than conquerors, but when we start to wear the the mantle of, I have victory over him, we need to, we might lose the secret ingredient here, which is submission <laughs> and right. the humility that Amen. we are to, to cloak ourselves in, that we finally understand here, it's not about us at all. Any strength that I exhibit is because the Holy Spirit is empowered and it's Jesus Christ who's beaten him. That's He's right. the one who conquered death. He's the one who's defeated Satan. So when Satan comes against us, we know, we highlighted these four last week, that he seeks to do at least four things against the Christian, which is to deceive, discourage, discredit, and distract. That one seems to be, well, like all four really uh, come to mind here because I, I recently, in fact, it just seems like every time I turn around, it seems like I'm getting a negative word and it just sucks the life out of you. Eventually, you just, you have to turn to the Lord, get in the word. This is where we're spiritually fed to combat all of the negati- ne- negativity that's just going on around us. I mean, you need only to turn on the news 
turn to social media, we're drowning in the negative. And so we have to go back to God's holy word, as Philippians tells us to do, well, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Philippi, giving us this instruction that we consume of that which is of righteousness, things that are praiseworthy, let our music be filled with adoration to the king. And so how we resist the devil, there are a number of tactics that we can take in this, but we have to understand that when we try to, to your point, uh, take this artificial sense of, of confidence and strength in our materialization of fleshly endeavors that I'm the strong one here. Devil, I rebuke you. Right. Wait a minute. Hold on. It's Jesus Christ who has the total authority over Amen. the wind and waves, over every circumstance, and yes, even over the devil himself. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12 to 13, he says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands... Take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. And something we've talked about, Dr. Ford, a time or two, is the fact you need only to go back and reread 2 Corinthians to be reminded by the Apostle Paul that he does deliberately give us more than we can handle. Right, So. Right. But he does make a way of escape, and he is the strength for us to stand firm in truth, but he also makes a way of an escape from the temptation that seeks to ensnare us. And we go back to Proverbs, and all you can do is just read one chapter after another about avoiding the the traps of the enemy, that he puts them out there, but we will often just walk right into them in our ignorance. We don't know the God, the word of God like we're supposed to. We're certainly not praying like we're supposed to. And we're not the disciplined soldiers of Jesus Christ that we're supposed to. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Read the whole chapter. There he talks about the discipline that we must have as we engage the enemy in a very real spiritual battlefield. So I want to encourage you, the the result here is that to what we're supposed to draw from this, we're to resist the devil. But to do that is the very next verse in James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Amen. This is not a, you, you got to put on your boots and muster up enough strength in your own initiatives and your own desires. No, the only way to combat the work of the enemy in and through your life and in around you is to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Yeah. When you read Ephesians six and it says to put on, you know, put on the armor of God, we really are putting on God. Mm. At, you know, in those and, and, and empowered by prayer, you know, because sometimes at the yeah. very end, you know, we talked about that as we covered Ephesians 6, just, you know, the, to really some where the power, you know, comes from prayer through the Holy Spirit uh, to embolden us to be able to use these things, which really, they really are putting on God. These are things that um, God is now a part of us. These are things that he has given us in order to be able to accomplish his will and purposes. But as you've made so clear, only through his power but not through own because we will fail on our own. That's right. But even just when we were talking about the Sermon on the Mount, it's the same thing. Those things are completely impossible without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so is our ability to resist the devil. That's right. And I found it more so lately in my life that the more of the darkness that I read about and hear about and how that can create such consternation in our spirit, because as quite frankly, many who are listening right now may just be a mom and dad just trying to pay the bills, right. take care of their children, raise them up in a home that honors God. And all around us, all we hear is wars and rumors of wars and the the darkness that seems to be getting darker, the sexual immorality that is prevalent around us. It, it, it's just such shocking, quite frankly, how far we have digressed as a people in these United States and in the Western states and nations Uh, And so we see all these things happening and it can just suck the life out of us. And so what I've found, the only way to combat that is to do as the disciples showed us to do. And we're to imitate Paul because Paul said, if you imitate me, you're imitating Christ. And he told Timothy, go and impart these things to trusted men. What we see there is he shows the replication factor. Timothy, Follow what I'm doing because I'm following what Christ showed me. And then you likewise go do to another and show them how to endure and to be strengthened to resist the devil on a daily basis here. And it's not just him personally. We know he's a fallen cherub and he has all these uh, demons running amok doing what they do. Chances are it's probably not the devil himself that is striking at us, although he wanted to sift Peter 
It's certainly the, the invisible things, the principalities and darkness that we see in Ephesians chapter 6 that is going on all around us. It can be the sin of men. It can be those who are filled with the demonic or, or influenced by the demonic, uh, by Satan himself. You know, all these things are going on. And I know we talked about this after the program last week. There are other intelligences at work here right. that are in opposition to the will and way of God. And so what I have found, the only way to combat these things is is to learn the practices of the disciples. They were prayers. It wasn't just the type of prayer that you go around the dinner table with or, or, or some sort of a casual, I'm getting into a parking lot, I'm just going to throw up some sort of 30-second prayer. I'm talking about getting on your hands and knees, getting into your private space, close the door, and, and lay these things before the Lord. I mean, get back to the practices that the disciples needed the strength of the Lord every day, and they would pray even three times a day. Nine, noon, and three, we see as a consistency through the book of Acts. And it's like, well, why would they need to pray so often? To which you could counter to say, why aren't you praying enough? Right. You're battling against a real enemy who in 1 Peter 5, 8, we're told, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, not just Oh, inconvenience a little bit. Right. He's out to destroy the followers of Jesus Christ. So if we're not taking our battle seriously, that we are soldiers for Jesus Christ, who in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're told by the Apostle Paul to young Timothy that we are to not get entangled with the affairs of this world. Don't put down deep roots in the soil. Focus on the prize that is before you. He gives three illustrations. He talks about the soldier, talks about the athlete, talks about the farmer, all areas that we can relate to of discipline, that we know that we're to be marching, we're to be engaging in in combat with the enemy, not to be cowering in, in the shadows somewhere and hoping it all just passes us by and maybe we'll just fall asleep and wake up in the arms of Jesus, <laughs> as opposed to being salt and light and doing something, being a voice of reason and truth in a culture of chaos, but doing it in a way as the evangelist, like the Apostle Paul when he in a minute went on Mars Hill. He didn't go up there mocking and insulting. He went up there with the intentionality to point them to truth. And so we can, sometimes we can have the right intention, right motive, and deliver it so poorly. You know, we, we sound like maybe the prophets of old, where we just come in there, you all sinners, you're going to hell. <laughs> okay, that might be effective sometimes, and sometimes we need to hear that. But I think we need to pray for the discernment to say, Lord, here I am, send me. There's a battlefield that is right in front of me. I'm scared. Yeah. I need your strength today. And if I dare arise and try to go into that battle space without your full armor, without the guidance and the words of the Holy Spirit, no wonder I fall on my face over and over again until I realize the severity of the situation that we're in. Dr. Ford, before you comment, let me just remind our listener, uh, this is a program of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church. You're listening to Engage in Truth, and that is our hope is that we do just that, Engage in Truth. As a, as a program of a Calvary Chapel Church, we'd encourage you to go check us out at calvaryfountain.com. We are an expository verse-by-verse -verse church down on the south end of Colorado Springs. We would love to worship with you. Services are 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Sundays. Please learn more. Support the ministry here, even this radio program. Uh, we can't do it without you. So, Dr. Ford, as we're still talking now about resisting the devil, you have written a number of notes, and I'm just in awe of what God has given you by way of wisdom here. What are some other takeaways we can give to our listener about how to resist the devil? Yeah, I think, and you know, it's important for us to, to believe, to realize, to accept the fact that while believers can be oppressed, that we cannot be possessed. Oh, right. And I think Good because, point. you know, you'll hear people talking about that. And I think it's really important, you know, can believers be demon inhabited? You know, this is a, a theological question that, I think if we really look at the idea of the Holy Spirit coming and, and living in us, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, as we see in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, that there's no way that those two could coincide together. Right. I mean, we definitely see clear examples of even Paul from 2 Corinthians 12, 7 with his thorn, you mm -hmm. know, being oppressed. But as believers in Jesus Christ, when the Holy Spirit comes to 
uh, live within us. There is nothing that can bind. Jesus said that we are in the hands of his father and his father is stronger than everyone, Mm -hmm. uh, that we don't need to worry about being possessed. But he sure can and sure will harass us along the way, (laughs) as you've described, as we get up each day being intentional about serving the Lord, as Jesus asked us to do, to be crucified each day to take up our cross uh, for him. And, And just as he did, as you pointed out, the importance of prayer. How many times do we hear about Jesus going off by himself to pray? Before he chooses the you know, the twelve, he goes out all night and he prays. So it's even before the cross, even before the cross. If it's important yeah. for the Son of God to spend time before his heavenly Father, how much more so us? That's right. I, I, we can really cultivate closer communion with God through prayer, and I think some of it has to do with the fact that we don't really know too much adversity yet as being Christians. Now, it may have cost us a promotion. Certainly, even as of late, I've heard uh, some scenarios going on with the Biden administration where Christians may not be able to apply for certain positions because they may deem them as an enemy of the state. I mean, we sort of heard a lot of these sort of things that give us a great deal of red flags and consternation because it's a reality going on all around us that there is seemingly a, a, a way before us where people are trying to label Christians as somehow hostile to the new uh, vision for America. And this new world order that is before us. So all these things are greatly concerning, and the scriptures have told us these things must happen. But we've not really suffered too much yet. Around the world, certainly Christians suffer a great deal, and and in that struggle, they learn how to cultivate prayer far, uh, I'd say better, but it is is a dependency on God that we uh, believers here in the West just haven't yet cultivated at times until we're in a posture of desperation, which you find in individuals who can't pay the rent that month right. or, or struggling to make ends meet. There is a desperation in their prayers that suddenly yields this total, Lord, I need you. I can't breathe without you. Please come into this situation. And I, I would ask that our listeners cultivate that kind of communion with God now before the desperate hours upon them. Yeah. Right now is the time to be real with the Lord, to depend on the Lord, to develop that relationship by way of prayer, not waiting until you're in the throes of the most difficult hour, because then it seems very reactive rather than proactive to say, while I have the opportunity to trust in the Lord and and build in that relationship and desirous to go into the prayer closet because I don't want to be anywhere else like Martin Luther He often is cited for the quote, work, work, work from early to late. I have so much to do. I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Well, you don't wait until you're in the throes of plague and pestilence and war or famine. You do that now. Yeah. And and Dr. Ford, we're about ready to head off to Israel here. And so you're going to be running solo uh, next week and probably the week after there. Um, But, uh, you know, and I want our listener to still tune in because I know they're in for quite a treat as you will host the program solo. But the reason being is because I'm taking a group to Israel. And one thing I've found very fitting in this particular study here today is the fact that anytime we seem to go to Israel, anytime we're going to Israel, anytime we're making plans to go there, it seems like any adversity, any possibility of adversity just seems to come up in in, in a thick display Uh, If I can use that as kind of a vivid illustration there, that if there was a possibility of adversity, you can amp that up. And I don't say that to discourage people from going to Israel, but what we know to be true in Scripture, especially in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, he says, I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you. And through you, I will bless all the nations. That's not the first time he says that. He even talks about that in Numbers chapter 24, verse 9. The nation is like a mighty lion. When it is sleeping, no one dares wake it. Whoever blesses Israel will be blessed, and whoever curses Israel will be cursed. So we've asked the Lord for that. Give us blessing and favor as we venture to Israel. And inevitably, it seems like the enemy amps up the uh, the throes of, of arrows and attacks and distractions and uh, you know, all sorts of things that could try to get in the way of going with this peace of mind. In fact, I've got friends who are also traveling with other groups to Israel right after we depart, the next day, in fact. And they're also going through all kinds of adversity in their personal life, in, in their businesses, all sorts of things. And I'm like, but what did you expect? You're going to, to walk 
in the very places where Jesus walked because you want to glorify the Father at that location and have an intimacy with him by being there in the very places, of course the enemy is going to come against that. So reverse engineer that. If you try to go to church more regularly, if you try to tithe more often or be more engaged in church service or regular ministry, whether it's at a a food pantry or soup kitchen or whatever it is, just try making a commitment and watch how the enemy will try to get in the way, distract and, oh, the car breaks down the day you're about ready to go to the food pantry and whatever it might be. We have to expect adversity when we are doing things that is laying up treasures in heaven, not laying up treasures on earth. The devil's not threatened by that. His empire is not impacted at all when we're just laying up treasures on earth. But when lives are being saved, when people are being impacted with the gospel message that's in us, as we live that out and deliberately go out of our way to inconvenience our schedule, our agendas, and our plans to bring God glory, expect opposition. Right. Why do we not do that? <laughs> it's, it's, it should be what we call, deem as common sense right. within Christendom. This is the reality of the, of the world in which we dwell. There are forces out there that hate the light, and we represent the light. So we've got to armor up. Yeah, and the fiery trials that we've talked about before. You know what I find interesting? If you think about the book of Job, none of those things can happen without passing through the hands of God first. So God is Mm -hmm. allowing those things to happen. That's right. For a purpose. And I believe it's exactly as you were talking about. You know, all the, as most of what we hear in the news is negativity. Negativity breeds negativity. Negativity brings people back next week to listen to the show again. Hey, everything's all great, sunshine, lollipops and roses, you know, tune in next week. No, nobody's coming back for that. Right. But it's that negativity that you can do nothing about that stirs a lot of anxiety and fear that brings us back. And there are so many things, disconcerting things on so many levels of our our culture happening throughout the world, whether we're talking about Russia or China or central bank digital currency or transhumanism or, you know, all the things that are going on in the world. What is the one answer? You nailed it right on the head, which is to press into the Lord now. That is the best thing to do. It's the only thing we can do. It's what we have to do to be prepared for the times that are coming. And there's some great fictional work out there that's probably been instrumental in some folks' lives. I mean, you think about Screw Tape Letters that's by right. C.S. Lewis. Yeah, that's a really uh, good this one. This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti. Yep. I mean, we've been saturated by some of this content uh, over the many years, but sometimes we get a little um, complacent, a uh, little desensitized to the reality that we are in, in a, a battle. spiritual battle. Yeah. And I think that's why we would encourage all of our listeners, go back, read Ephesians 6. Be mindful of this. This is a daily thing. Uh, because Paul makes it quite clear in Romans. Uh, you just make your way through Romans 5 to 7, in fact, and he really outlines the weakness of our flesh, right. that it is in constant uh, friction with the work of the Holy Spirit who's in us. So it's not just a battle from without. It's a battle from within. That journey between your brain and your heart is a big one because you can be knowledgeable of the things of God but not persuaded by the things of God. And if you're persuaded, you'll live like it. Because if you really believe that this is the one life you have to give for Jesus Christ, that there are no do-overs, that you're a living sacrifice, that you have said, not my way be done, but your way be done. Have your way with me. Here I am, Lord, send me. This is all to your glorious purposes, and I want to give every breath I've got to your glory. And wasn't it Romans 5 where Paul says we rejoice in our sufferings? Our mm-hmm. sufferings produce oh, endurance. Our endurance produces character. Our character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. That's right. Even and, in 2 Corinthians, he is reminded that I, I dare not take the strength in myself, but in he who is able to raise the dead. That's right. Right. That he, he comes through one adversity after another after another. And this is the Apostle Paul. And, and there were times when he didn't have any money and times when he did in some of his right. greatest works while he was in prison. And, and what we would consider to be defeat is actually great victory where Paul and Silas are praising while in the stockade <laughs> the stocks, yeah. and they've been beaten wrongfully and all these things that we go, wow, we've got to change our paradigm. Yeah. When I suffer for his glory, as Peter talks about, when we are beaten for his namesake, we are commended before yeah. the heavenlies. You can almost picture a heavenly chorus of angels cheering you on going, yes, yeah. now you're living the life that you've been called to. Put aside all the shackles that bind you to the ways of Babylon. Live as free men in Christ Jesus, but don't use that freedom as a license for sin. Use it to bring glory to God while there is breath to be breathed for his glorious purposes 
We're out of time, Dr. Ford, so you're going to have to carry the show alone <laughs> next week. As, as I've just mentioned, we're going to be in Israel. We'd appreciate all of your prayers, taking a group there, about 40 of us, uh, going to Tel Aviv and then venturing all around Israel because we're going to make our way into Jerusalem and Bethlehem. We've got some churches there we're going to be praying with and encouraging believers there, especially some Arab Christians, Stephen Curry, amongst many others. Looking forward to that. It's really an opportunity for us to pray on location to read God's Word on location. We do offer these trips about every other year or so. And and so, again, if you'd like to learn more about this ministry, this is Engage in Truth. It is a ministry of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church. You can learn more at calvaryfountain.com, and services are 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Sundays. We would love to see you there. God bless you, my friends. Take care. Take care.